Okay, we are back, and today we're going to start our discussion on some milestones in networking. Um, this is probably the other major theme in the book. Not only have various types of computing technology contributed significantly to um, a lot of the advances in our society, um, changes in networking, um, communications uh, systems, the dispersal of information to individuals has has radically changed our society. So I've mentioned in the past lecture that, you know, in the past we had, you know, the telegraph, the telephone, typewriters, teletypes, progressively making it um, um, the flow of information um, uh, quicker and quicker. It accelerates the speed at which information reaches individuals, right? And to progressively larger audiences, right? So those particular technologies in the first bullet point are obviously more um, text-based ones, right? Um, obviously, um, for the most part, except for the telephone. The telephone obviously is a voice medium, right? And there are pros and cons to each of those, right? So, and um, some are more synchronous than the others, but they are technology through which we were able to continually spread information more quickly. Um, it allowed um, more individuals to participate in the spread of information around the world, right? So, and it provided uh, mechanisms by which um, to interface with other devices, right? So, and then obviously radio and television were mass market mediums that were, that allowed us to um, reach um, you know, uh, sizable audiences. Um, obviously, at the very beginning, neither radio or television um, were able to reach a whole lot of folks, and radio was not even envisioned necessarily as being a um, entertainment medium at first, right? Um, it had other intended uses, um, just like the telephone had other intended uses, but people found other ways to make those particular technologies more useful to them. So, and then obviously, um, you know, in the early days of computing, the, the ability to have sort of remote computing or time-shared computing um, has kind of found, um, found its way into our society. Um, obviously, we take advantage of remote computing to, to a great extent today to reach computing sources that are fixed or um, otherwise can be moved around easily and need to be utilized by multiple uh, individuals or groups. Um, ARPANET is obviously the um, predecessor to our modern internet and it was responsible for being sort of the um, incubator for many of the uh, internet-based applications that we have today, right? Electronic mail, chat, um, uh, file distribution, that sort of thing, right? And then obviously our internet, our network of networks, right, um, that, are, that has global reach now um, is uh, very fundamental and important to our everyday life of um, conducting business and communicating with, uh, with folks and just um, it's an essential part of our life. It would be very hard to go back to a non-internet world. Not impossible, but it would be difficult, right? Um, Obviously, uh, broadband communications has helped in making the internet more accessible to more folks in more places. And these numbers here that you see are dated based on this particular book, right? So it's a 2017 edition-ish, I think. So back at the time this thing was published, Japan was obviously the first in the world with an average speed of 63 megabits per second. South Korea was second at 40. And poor old United States was down at number 15 at 2. Not even typically enough for one high definition stream, right? Um, I think the government has reclassified broadband as being from being probably I don't know probably one megabit per second to I think it's twenty now. I think they they do say it's something meaningful enough to be able to support HD streams if you had to, and really even four K streams. So I don't know what the average speed would be now. I'd have to go look that up, but I, I would hope it's certainly higher than two, right? Um, your mileage can vary, right? In Apple Valley, I can get 110 on a good day, right, on, on a share cable medium. Uh, I might be able to even get 400 now, 
Right. University upgraded their Spectrum business class internet from 2 gigabit per second to 5 to support all this extra um, remote learning that we're doing um, this time around. And um, that's pretty remarkable in, in the rural section of Ohio to be able to get those types of communication speeds. Um, obviously, there are many places within these counties where Spectrum doesn't reach, and DSL only provides maybe 10 megabit per second on a good day. Um, good enough for doing the basics, but not you know a whole lot, and obviously there are limits. But um, needless to say, it's still it's better than having nothing, and it's made a big change in our lives. Oops, let me grab my mouse cursor. Okay, so remember we talked about the telegraph towers last time a little bit, right? So pre-electronic telegraph towers, you know, we could send our electrical beeps and boops across a, a wire from place to place, um, uh, you know, emerging in the 19th later parts of the 19th century. Uh, before that, you had these big tall towers, and you had these very interesting looking um you know apparatus on top of the towers i don't re i'm trying to recall this conversation i'm not sure if there were like flags that were held from there if um if it was just the motion of those mechanical arms that would indicate different messages or characters of the alphabet or if flags were really needed to indicate those kind of like you know how it is with um sailors on navy boats right I think even to this day, they're still instructed, um, certain ones, on how to communicate using flags because there are times when digital communication can't be relied on 100% of the time, or radio communications, you know, however you want to say it. And so the visual signaling mechanisms are needed. And, and this kind of how it was the entire people would use these apparatus to communicate a message from point to point. There would be these towers that were spaced, I don't know, I forget what the amount would was mentioned in the book, but um, obviously close enough that a person on another tower could be, I guess, looking through with a telescope or some sort of binoculars or some sort of optical device and pick up on what the person was doing and then do the same set of motions down to the next station until it got all the way to where it needed to be. And I'm sure for their day and time, this was not. This was a lot of building. This was a lot of infrastructure. This was not a, a cheap thing for their for the governments to do. So, anyhow, um, hello. All right. I think that's fun. All right. So electricity and electromagnetism, obviously. What we saw with that particular telegraph tower was a mechanical process, right? Later on, those types of, of telegraph towers, especially in the United States, cut, well, we really never had them to start with in the United States. We just pretty much bypassed that era and started with the electrical telegraph, uh, much like a lot of countries today that never really had formal landline-based telephone infrastructures have kind of bypassed those to go with um, cellular mobile structures because uh, you know, radio emissions, right? Uh, electro, um, um, those types of emissions are a lot easier to, to use in a wireless format than they are stringing wires across the landscape and digging stuff up and laying wires and, and all sorts of, right? It's a lot more infrastructure work, a lot more manual labor. It's just hard to do it. So instead, you know, um, you know, um, you know, modern societies use, you know, use mobile infrastructure. So likewise, um, one of the things that help facilitate these types of technologies, because these technologies often depend on developments in other unrelated areas in order for it to take off, and a lot of times the contributions that are done to invent new technology or um, sort of, you know, refinements within a particular technology can be used to facilitate the development in other areas. So. It's sort of this interesting dynamic sort of um, um, force that takes place and shapes new technologies. And for these communication mechanisms to, to, to uh, take off, um, obviously we needed electricity and electromagnetism, right? There's this 
um, relationship between electricity and magnetism, right? And understanding that relationship is very important to making all this stuff work. So in 1799, Volta invented the battery. Um, Orsted came along, electricity creates a magnetic field, right? Um, those are some of the principles, right? Like um, behind, you know, like a telephone, right? You know, they're, they're, your voice shakes a magnet, that magnet is connected to something that generates an electrical signal, right? Against a carrier wave, it goes to its responding location. It all gets kind of reversed at the receiving end, right? At least traditionally analog, you know, formats. And, you know, Sturgeon came along here, he constructed the electromagnet, and then, you know, by 1830, Henry came along and suggested how communication could be done with this electromagnet it's because of that interplay between magnetism and electricity. And I'm sorry to the, to the, engineer, to the electrical engineers in, in the room, obviously, I do a horrible job of explaining those sorts of things, being just a, a computer scientist, but, you know, I, I do my best with it. So, the telegraph. The telegraph was, um, if I recall the history behind this, it, it was hard for the U.S. government to actually provide the funding to this initially. Um, there were some, I think there were a lot of proposals, and people tried to get them to fund it, and it kind of was, it, it, you know, typical government bureaucracy. It takes a while for these things to get off the ground. But eventually they did fund um, one of the proposals from uh, Samuel Morse. And first line was built from DC to Baltimore in the 1840s. It proved itself to be incredibly reliable and um, a superior uh, communications mechanism to those manual telegraph uh, systems. Uh, and private networks quickly started flourishing. You saw the telegraph lines start to pop up all over the place, right? Um, typical American entrepreneurial spirit at play. So there were 12,000 miles of lines by the 1850s. Obviously, the first transcontinental line came about 1861, and the Pony Express had been operating for several years in that time, which provided for rapid delivery of written correspondence, quickly went out of business, right? And, um, and by 1877, there was 200,000 miles of line, right? So within a generation, basically, you know, um, this, this communication mechanism had just exploded in, in size. And there were all sorts of ancillary um, refinements that were able to be done, right? There were fire alarm boxes, right? So way back when, in the 19th century, um, when you didn't have telephones and you didn't have GPS systems and all that sort of stuff, um, in very large cities, fire departments needed to be able to figure out where fires were had started and route the appropriate you know fire apparatus such as such as it was for that time their equivalent of a horse and buggy fire truck um, to the right location to try to put out a fire so telegraph wires were connected up to these fire alarm boxes if a fire developed in a given region of a city someone could go out and activate one of these fire alarm boxes that would send a signal to the appropriate you know fire station and it would just provide a pre-recorded identifier of which um, box was triggered. So they kind of have a rough idea of where the fire was was uh, occurring and then they would travel to that general area and then hopefully it would be obvious where the fire was at that point. And then obviously along the fire alarm boxes there were police call boxes, right? So when people felt they were in distress they could do that. Now obviously this was a technology outgrowth that could only be financed and supported in, in the largest of cities, right? and um, in, in probably some medium-sized cities, I guess, if they were forward-thinking. This is obviously not something that you were going to find, find everywhere. Right. And obviously this picture just demonstrates, obviously, the Pony Express and the last remnants of the rider going by as they're stringing up this transcontinental telegraph line, right? He's looking there, he sees this job, is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to find some new work to do. And that's and then that's just the nature of technology, right? New technologies um, don't develop in a vacuum. Some technologies, um, you know, will displace people um, in in certain professions, right? They're going to lose their jobs, and 
hopefully they can find new work or hopefully there's some sort of um, you know private or government program that can help them train them in or, um, into some new line of work um, sometimes people kind of get lost in the mix and that's just the nature of technology causing societal disruption and it's something we can explore in our in-classroom uh, discussions about the ethics of how technologies can cause some people to lose their jobs can cause the creation of new jobs um, how do people bridge um, from working on one type of technology to another um, how do they respond to those situations what should we do as a society to help folks out that are displaced uh, by near technologies All right. so obviously the follow-up to the telegraph is telephone right and again taking advantage of that whole electricity and, and magnetism um, relationship right the, in microphones and speakers and that sort of stuff we were able to put together you know essentially the telephone right so Ale Alexander Graham Bell constructed the harmonic telegraph which if I recall the, the book discussion on this this was something that allowed basically for parallel um, a parallelization of communications to take place right you could have multiple conversations go across one line you're just kind of duplex you know you're, you're essentially multiplexing those conversations you're making the communication um, medium more efficient right um, and eventually that didn't really catch on it was a nice refinement it was you know it was, it was, a, it was a very interesting development but he was still able to take that and kind of use that for developing the first telephone right and um, it had a big impact on society when the telephone was developed it was uh, you know you didn't have to go to uh, a store somewhere pay someone to transmit a message a, a very pricey message generally speaking um, you know you didn't have to you know and then wait for that message to be printed out and you know delivered to someone and have that person go back and you know communicate a message back right again at a very high price so that's why the written letter was still used so much because it was a far cheaper medium even if it took a lot longer to communicate with someone anyhow so telephone comes along and now it starts to blur the public life and private life boundary even more than what's already been done right so um, um, it eroded traditional social hierarchies and reduced privacy people wrote articles about the dangers that the telephone was going to introduce into the house uh, household the common household some thought maybe should only be limited to business use that sort of thing um, people worried about um, you know certain you know formal mannerisms going out of style because of the telephone right it was going to cre create distance between people and that sort of thing um, but it but the telephone also did things like enable the first online communities right so a lot of phones everyone kind of shared that same connection right they were called party lines back in the day and you picked up and you could hear everyone else's conversation right in order to actually reach someone specific you had to use an operator and provide a, some sort of identifier to that individual right if that was even a, a you know possibility in the really early days you just picked up and s see if the other person was there or you asked someone to go tell someone to pick up the phone that sort of thing right so th those mechanisms of addressing and being able to reach individuals and having operators to help you know connect those calls and stuff came along later so typewriter and teletype right so the typewriter allowed for the individual production of typeset documents right so and it, it was a, it was a game changer you know writing can be slow and laborious and and it's hard to correct mistakes and that sort of thing on on, on, on paper and pencil or pen right so it comes along and it's great and uh, you know i grew up you know as a kid you know not having a, a computer in my house until i was 12. is it 12? yeah 12. yeah 90. i think it was around 12 right and um no not even 12 14. 
I think 14. 14 when I got my first computer. I had friends when I was a few years younger that had computers, so I was able to always mainly play games on. But my own computer to do things, I was 14. I, we did have a typewriter a few years before that, um, one of the, an electrical typewriter, um, not a word processor, which is sort of these intermediate devices between computers and typewriters where you could actually store documents on like a floppy disk and then bring them back out and keep editing them when you're done and have it all print out on like it was a typewriter. Um, but a typewriter still was a, a handy productivity tool. And they were common office place environments because, you know, like a lot of these technologies, they're really expensive, only businesses can afford them at first. So they were, they were common um, in most offices, so by the 1890s. So. And teletype um, it's just basically a typewriter connected to a telegraph line in the early days. Later on, they were also used in as an input and output device in early uh, mainframe, you know, or a terminal, um, uh, mainframe systems, they were used like a terminal device in, in certain um, systems um, in early computing days. Um, they had a lot of uses, right? They were used for transmitting news stories and sending records of stock transactions. Very popular in that domain, and again, much like a lot of things, Wall Street are first adopters to anything that can speed up uh, tra uh, trading um, transactions, right? Because speed is everything when it comes to, to to stock transactions and buying and selling and doing margin calls and you know your options and all this sort of stuff and doing arbitrage on certain types of um, you know trades and that sort of thing. Radio, um, obviously radio just wasn't invented all at one time. It needed a lot of different technologies to be developed for it to be, um, to come in, in, to be realized as its own thing, right? So it depended on people like Hertz that generated um, and did a lot of research and studies around electromagnetic waves. It depended on Marconi who, um, who came along and invented radio sort of wire, you know, sort of as a, you know, sort of, um, I think he may have did work on wireless telegraphs, that sort of thing first, and then that eventually got leveraged into radio, right, because it wasn't a huge jump, you know, to go from from just sending those, you know, s those beeps and boops, right, for, for um, telegraph um, wires over seamlessly to using microphones and speakers, right? So, in any case, um, you know, wireless telegraph was the initial application of radio. And then later on, people figured out how to transmit these voices. Uh, and then people finally figured out that it could have uses other than just doing ship-to-ship -ship communications, right? Um, people thought, well, it could be an entertainment medium in and of itself. And there was a lot of technologies that had to be developed around making radios usable within homes, right? And little things like being able to, you know, set up, you know, they have different, you know, individuals or businesses or groups transmit on different frequencies, right? There had to be a way to tune to those frequencies, and and um, and have sort of a, sort of have, um, and then there was a whole regulatory infrastructure that had to be developed around that. Like, you can use, you know, eighty megahertz, or you could use five hundred hertz, right? And, you know, or you could use you know, a given part of the um, electromagnetic spectrum, right? Um, you know, those, those um, frequencies, um, you know, if someone had a bigger transmitter, they were going to stomp all over your transmission. So we needed a, a regulatory structure around that. Okay. So obviously, again, not all this technology didn't come about all at once, and there are variations of it. And... The radio and the television um, technology developments are studied a lot more in, in the GPS technology course. It's really fascinating stuff. Um, but in any case, um, it became popular in the 50s. Um, although the earliest televisions were invented, um, I think most of the earliest attempts were probably late 30s. I forget if it followed back to the late 20s or not, but early. There were early attempts back into the early 30s on it, but like a lot of technologies, it really takes 10 to 20 years of work on it to get mass appeal from it. So, 
you look at the research papers now and you're seeing thing, new things that people are developing in terms of new technologies or new inventions or you look and see what researchers are doing at universities some of that stuff probably won't see um, its way into our society now until the 2040s the stuff that's in academia right or in the industrial research labs right you know some of it may come quicker than other aspects of it just depends and you know, there's no you know no um, rule that says something has to take 20 years of development to be uh, completely realized as an invention and make its way into society. Some things go quicker, some things take a lot longer than even 20 years. So, in any case, um, te with television, it became popular in the 50s, right? These little black and white TVs, very small screens, very expensive um, initially, and then obviously, like a lot of things, the prices started to fall dramatically on them, and, and more and more households could afford them. And the number of stations increased, obviously, because you had lots uh, more individuals and families that were watching televisions. And it provided a, a way to entertain people, to tell people about the um, important events taking place in their communities and in, in the nation at large. And it had a huge impact, right? Life shifted to around uh, families being around the TV in the evening hours, right? Before that, it was the families gathered around the radio. And uh, a lot of the more inner, like um, like the soap operas, made a transition from the radios to the television, for instance. Um, a lot of the other dramatized, dramatized productions went from from uh, radio to television, right? What did the radio keep for the most part? Well, it kept um, you know talk programs of one sort or another and, and music, right? So. Um, not that you couldn't have that on, on TV, but it tended to lend itself to other types of programming. Right? And obviously it could have an impact, right, in terms of the elections, from the 52 election with Dewey and Eisenhower to, um, you know, the 2000 presidential election and them trying to call it early for Dan Quell before the debacle, or not for Dan Quell, oh my goodness, to declare for Al Gore, right, um, instead of George Bush. And um, and then you had the whole thing with Florida and the hanging, hanging chads and the Supreme Court challenges on what counted for a vote or not. And technically, George Bush winning the Electoral College because, you know, the Florida count was, I don't know, it was decided by hundreds or, or a few thousand votes. It was a very small number in terms of the millions and millions of votes that were cast in the presidential election. And it had a profound impact, and we were glued to our screens because of it. September 11th, everyone was glued to their television for the most part. Yeah, the web was around by this point, and people could go online to get their news, but it would, it still didn't have the, the visual impact of seeing stuff on the TV because video was still, it was growing in importance, but it was still small, right? This was years before YouTube came around. And... Um, and it just it, the video experiences on the web still weren't very good in, in the early aughts. And so television just was a much better medium for that sort of thing. So, right, and there certainly weren't any Netflixes and Hulus and all those other TV services. Right, so. Right. so obviously television allowed us to watch the first man walk on the moon, right, in 1969 with the Apollo missions. And that was profound. That was a momentous event and for a lot of people of that day and age. Everyone kind of remembered um, where they were when they watched the first man uh, step foot on the moon. And that's still something, you know, as our society, we haven't really gone back and did because it cost the equivalent of a trillion dollars in R&D to do that, you know, in our, in our day and age. So um, but that was remarkable. You know, we could see something delayed by, you know, seven seconds or so or whatever it is for the speed of light. But there you go. It was it was remarkable. Um, you know, it, it was long it was before my time obviously, but um it obviously had an impact on people. So, and hopefully we'll get back there in a few years. Alright, remote computing was obviously uh, an important development in terms of network communications technologies. All right, so Stibitz and Williams built the complex number calculator at Bell Labs, right? Uh, Bell Labs, um, a lot of these um, 
um, 20th century companies had huge R&D labs that allowed for the development of a remarkable set of applied technologies. And to some extent, basic research could be done there, and companies were supportive of those basic research efforts. Um, less so as the decades would wear on, and stockholders would be demanding you know, quicker returns on their investments, and R&D labs were much more um, centered around um, using their R&D dollars towards applied technology that they could be assured of getting a return on. And that obviously drove things towards more and more applied research efforts. Um, but anyways, not, you know, back in the day there was more room for that stuff. Anyhow, so in terms of remote computing, so you have these mainframe systems, and if you could, you know, and obviously they were operator driven, so you only had one person that could access the system at a time. You had to bring your decks of punch cards into the to the computer operator. Have them, you know, if you didn't do it yourself, you had to load in your compiler or your your loader program. You had to bring in and load the program, and you had to run lo load your data, and you had to crunch all that data and write it out somehow. Uh, by having these teletype stations and having them wired all up to the mainframe system or mini computer, you could allow a lot of different individuals to utilize this hardware at the same time, provided you provided some mechanism to support multiple users and control their interactions with the system so that one person didn't step on top of another. And um, teletype was a primitive method of doing input and output, but it, uh, you know, it allowed for that. And, you know, it wasn't a big leap to go from, well, you could have teletype stations on different floors of a building to now do those over the traditional telephone wires. So, and there were long distance demonstrations of, of remote computing between New Hampshire and New York City. I probably have some links to it in the supplemental resources that you can look at. All right, so ARPANET. DOD created the uh, ARPA in the late 50s. No, Al Gore did not invent the internet. All right, so that was one of the big uh, um, missteps that Al Gore made in his presidential election back in the day. I, I'm sure it's kind of been blown out of proportion over the years for, with what he said versus the reality of it. But, um, you know, like a lot of these things, the quote-unquote internet, as we take it, which is really made up of a lot of technologies, was created by a lot of different researchers and individuals and supported by different groups. Right? Um, so, uh, um, Lick Leader, um, or Lick Leiter, I, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name here, uh, conceived of this uh, galactic network originally, right? And it, it was envisioned as being a sort of decentralized uh, design to improve survivability. And not, and, I, and I'm, everyone always makes a joke, well, it was designed to survive uh, a, a nuclear explosion, some sort of nuclear holocaust. No. The ARPANET, and that's a misstatement, the ARPANET was not designed to survive a end of the world, you know, apocalyptic, you know, large scale nuclear strike, right? That was going to wipe out civilization. Um, you know, you'd be lucky if you had running electricity anywhere, right? Um, but with that said, it was designed that you could knock out a node or two here and there and the network would still find a way to route information from one point to another around the, the parts that were taken out. So it had resilience, right? Some level of resilience. So, and then eventually they, we figured out that packing, packet switching had a lot of advantages over circuit switching. Uh, circuit switching still has its particular advantages in certain cases, but packet switching uh, overall is a superior uh, communications technologies for networked computer systems, right? So. All right. And basically, um, circuit switch versus packet switch. In a circuit switch, you have dedicated links from one system to another, and there's one fixed route for information to be communicated, whether it's voice, that's data, whatever. Um, and it has to go over that particular uh, uh, communication. Packet switching, everything is kind of connected to everyone, and you have discrete units. Uh, you set up connections from uh, temporarily from point to point, right? 
and a session basically. You set up sessions. Um, you don't have a dedicated circuit. And, and packets are somehow tied to those sessions, right? They're marked as belonging to a given session, just to simplify the whole discussion. And that's what you see in the different colored icons down here on a packet switch network. So all these items that are white, I guess in color, are associated with communication from this system. Um, uh, I guess they're white. I guess that's white. There's white, gray, and black. So there's this white packet, and then that packet's here, and then that packet's here, and that packet's here, and it reads the system. So it goes from this system to this system over a given set of links, right? And then you have this gray packet that starts here on this other system. It's a gray packet here. It's on the same link that we sent the white packet and, all, and then also this black packet over. But it's meant to go to this system here, right? So the white packets went there, the gray packets went here. And the black packets originate from this system. Some can go get routed from this point to this router to that router. Some other back packets go, go from this router to this router. But in all cases, those packets end up at this particular system. And that's the great thing. It's the flexibility um, that is provided by a packet switch network. We can take those you know, packets, and depending on you know, if there's more routers, great. We have more choices in which the route packets are and hopefully we can find the fastest pass. But if they become congested, there's resiliency in which we can take a slightly longer way to get the, those packets of information from one point to another. Oh, I'm getting click happy. I'm going to pause for a second. Nope, I don't need to do that. Never mind. All right, so um, email was one of the great applications of the early ARPANET days, right? So in terms of its creation, Tomlinson at BBN kind of wrote messages to send and receive email messages. Roberts kind of created the email utility as it was, right? Um, it's really the killer application of our modern network um, devices, right? Um, email found its way and use from just local communications within an organization, right? Even before the internet, where people would set up local mail exchanges, right? It, it found its use on bulletin board systems. It found its use in cl uh, close proprietary communication networks like Prodigy and America Online and CompuServe and that sort of thing. And eventually, those networks were opened up to the larger internet where email was also a killer application there. And today, billions upon billions of messages are sent every day. Good number of those are spam, but a good number of those are also legitimate communications between businesses and, and individuals and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a wonderful, um, it's primitive, it's simple, um, but, you know, it works. It's 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 generally pretty reliable. So. All right. So the internet, right? So Khan conceived of uh, there being a sort of open architecture and networking, and then obviously Surf and Khan designed the C TCP IP protocol for you know, what was originally the ARPANET because we needed to have some session management and routing. Um, so, you know, we needed to have, you know, session management, transport protocols, routing protocols, hence the internet protocol, right? Um, we needed to have um, those types of capabilities built into the network to make it a, a reliable one. And then obviously the internet is just a network of networks, right? So, in any case, um, there were other networking standards, you know, here and there at the transport and, and routing layers over time, but TCP IP is the one that has won out. And, uh, and it, it works well enough. I mean, it's the big thing that it, it doesn't have security built in, right? It's not got built in encryption on its own, right? Because people back in the day didn't anticipate the ways in which the modern internet might be used and that there may be rogue actors and people design want to 
um, uh, cause bad things to happen, right? So, and even if, even if they had had the foresight of doing this, doing, you know, providing, you know, you know, you know, hashing algorithms and encryption algorithms, all sort of stuff to provide, you know, integrity and authentication and privacy and all this other stuff would have overwhelmed the computing devices of the day, right? Because a lot of that is pretty heavy math. And um, you, you could have scaled the key sizes down and, and kept it to some of those earlier protocols. It was, still would have been a lot for the hardware of the day to have uh, handled. So, in any case, and people probably would have made it optional, so no one would have really did it because no one would have, again, not had that really that insight into rogue actors and, and people trying to cause all sorts of mischief on the internet. All right. So the National Science Foundation Net uh, was created by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it provided access grants to universities. It encouraged commercial subscribers for regional networks. There was a time when you could not do commercial traffic on the internet, believe it or not, right? Um, we think of that's all it tends to be used for are commercial activities, but there was a time when you couldn't do that. Eventually, those restrictions were loosened, right? Um, and once those private networks got established, NSF kind of shut down the NSF net backbone and kind of got out of the way and let the rest of society take it over. So, right. So at the time your book was published, right, it wanted to say, okay, well, what is broadband? How do we define broadband? It's a, other than saying it's a high-speed internet connection. Um, it should be some broadband in, 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 from a definition standpoint, it should be something that allows for the transfer of, of, of large files in a reasonable amount of time, right? And typically that could be video files, right? And the definition and scope of broadband has changed over the years and decades, right? And obviously, with greater bandwidth comes people utilizing that bandwidth um, for all sorts of interesting applications, such as uh, file swapping. Sometimes we have content that is not um, that has IP surrounding it, and it's not Creative Commons license, right? It's just outright pirated material. So, and at the time this book was done, you had typical broadband speeds. Say again, this sort of this is a different chart. It seems like these speeds are a little bit different than in the other uh, slide. 14, 10, and 7.4 megabits per second, right? So 8 bits make a byte, right? So you divide that by 8, right? So you're basically talking about a little over a megabyte per second of data. So, you know, it's basically a floppy disk a second of data for those that can remember floppy disk. So, um, and that's under ideal conditions, of course. All right, so here was a test that I think I must have ran on my own systems. Oh, no, no. Uh, no, this is not on my own systems. Um, it's mobile data, and these are speed averages. All right. So um, obviously 24 down and 9 up is the global average back in 2018. Iceland, in this case, was ranked as being the first at 72. Um, in Canada, where well, we are Canadians, how is that 59, right? And let's see here. I think that's mobile broadband, and which is pretty good for mobile broadband. And then the right side must be for fixed uh, broadband lines, right? So your traditional DSL cable, that sort of thing. And there, Singapore led the nation at 185. And then Romania was actually not too far behind, of all places, 129, right? So a lot of people don't think of Romania as being a particularly, I don't know, a cosmopolitan place. That's not been my experience. I've been there. It's, uh, it is a very, it has its cosmopolitan sort of cities and areas, just like any other place. And it's more rural and backward areas, just like any place. So, um, so some things better in other countries and not as well at other things. But in this chart at this time, it was holding its own in terms of 
internet um, um, capabilities. So. <laughs> So wireless networks. So wireless networks go all the way back to the you know, 1970s, a few years before I was even born. And the early cell phones, if you want to call that, weighed, you know, two and a half pounds, right? And today they weigh ounces, right? And they went from just being able to do voice calling to supporting texting to supporting, you know, internet out, um, access. And obviously, the go along with the growth of, cell, of cellular communications has been homes and businesses being able to utilize wireless communications, right, on the unlicensed 2.4 and 5 gigahertz spectrums. And just recently uh, announced, you know, people can also use 6 gigahertz, right, with newer Wi Fi standards coming out. And these are all unlicensed, right? Anyone can talk to anyone, and certain devices can obviously interfere, you know, like an old microwave or you know, a fan or something else that isn't well shielded could cause interference in these wireless networks but they let us very easily set up networks and have devices communicate across these networks at somewhat slower speeds and landlines and it works so and it's in, and people get annoyed if they go into a business and they don't have um, sort of a hotspot you know wireless capability there right they'd like to be able to access that and i think there's a lot of security issues that have come about in the use of of accessing a public wi-fi spot i prefer not to if given the choice if i can use my mobile device and set up my own mobile hotspot and use my you know phone's wi-fi um, access point i will use that over a business's wi-fi access point any day of the week so and you should too just because that is just a more secure arrangement. Why should you give a business, you know, any indication? You know, granted, most of the data is, is encrypted nowadays, but there's still a lot of metadata that's contained in terms of who am I connecting to, how much data am I sending to those places, um, how many connections am I making, what types of data is going across, even if you can't see what's inside the data. So, and that's information businesses actually can take and sell, right? So they provide you the Wi-Fi, they provide the service, but they can also take that information and sell it to marketers and that sort of thing. They find it useful. So, what have been the milestones in information storage and retrieval? Well, you want to go all the way back, right, uh, to biblical times. We had scrolls, and then we had codexes, and we had scribes, right, that maintained all these documents. And it was only a certain class of people went to the trouble of learning how to read and write, and because you know that was an effort. And maintaining all these ancient documents was was very laborious and time consuming. Making copies was time consuming, right? And that's how it was until you basically had Gutenberg in, in the movable offset, you know, printing press, right? And that revolutionized the world in profound ways, right? It made the Protestant Reformation possible. Um, and just it ushered in the Renaissance, essentially, right? In part. And then eventually from that, we had the first in 17th, 18th century, and you know, places like England, the first newspapers established, right? And that helped uh, facilitate the spread of information even more quickly, right? Because now you were able to take printing presses, which had been used for printing books and tracts and treatises and positional arguments and all that sort of stuff. And now you have companies that were being built around this that were dedicated to telling everyone about the events of the day happening in their community. That's all a newspaper is, really, right? And in order to finance that to a large extent, you know, they sell a lot of advertisements with a little bit of content. And then later on, you know, as the web, as the internet was getting developed, and another one of its killer applications was that of the World Wide Web, right? And the World Wide Web depends on the use of um, markup languages, right? So you had a general graphics markup language, right, um, that existed for a long time, and you know, components of that had this notion of you could link to one document to another. Um, hypertext markup language was obviously a simplification of those technologies, right? And we all remember Tim Beneers Lee, and he was working at CERN in Switzerland. And they needed a way to manage their documents, so they took this 
der derivation from SGML, created HTML, HTML um, you know, where you could link one document to another and off to the races everyone went with the web. And in the early, from the early 90s when it first came out, the web just exploded in popularity. So, um, you know, there were other document management technologies in the internet era before the web. You know, they had things like Gopher was another protocol for doing document management and retrieval. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, you had Usenet forms where people would, it was plain text, but like with email attachments, you could encode uh, documents for, um, you know, for storing onto a Usenet website, for instance, and you could decode those files off there into a binary format that was recognizable by your computer. So you had Gopher, you had Usenet, um, you had Internet Relay Chat, right? People could, again, encode and decode the transfer of files there, or documents, but the web just made it so much easier to um, facilitate um, the exchange of information over those other formats, particularly things like Gopher, right? Gopher allows out. No one goes to a Gopher site anymore. They still exist. Um, there's actually even a Chrome plugin for uh, Gopher, but um, it's sort of an esoteric thing. Not many people utilize it, not you know, outside of the universities anymore, right? So, and obviously the web got huge and unmanageable, right? There were directory listings in the early days of the web. People went to Yahoo Pages, right? And it was this sort of human um, driven organization of what was on the web, right? At one point you could print guides or have CD-ROMs or that basically described the entire web, right? It was small enough back in the day. Eventually the web got too much to do manual um, um, indexing, right, um, of it, and you needed these automated programs and crawler-based systems to kind of go across the web. Um, and web engines were awful in the early days. They were better than not having web engines, right, and they were obviously superior to having humans create sort of these yellow pages on the web sort of thing. Um, then obviously the web engines got better and better, and then you had companies like, our, you know, you know you know, um, um, Bryn uh, with Google and that sort of stuff came along and, um, you know, created algorithms that said, you know, you know, how do we rank things in terms of finding the most relevant information? Well, look at who links to a given document. The more people that link to a given document, the more relevant that people probably found that document. So it's going to get a higher ranking in our system, right? And that's a gross oversimplification of the work that you know, you know that Bryn did with Google and that sort of thing, but um, um, you know, it's um, it was made search engines more efficient, right? And just each of those technologies kind of loosened us from a dependence on having to memorize everything and transmit things by oral tradition, and just sped up and sped up and sped up the speed at which information was communicated throughout the world. For better or worse. Alright, so again, jumping back, the Greek alphabet was a huge jump over earlier um, um, written systems for uh, communicating information. It was a true alphabet. You had letters for both consonants and vowels. It was just a simple set of, 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 of phonics. It was just phonics, right? Just simple sound um, for, for characters and vowels. We could put those together in a very efficient way to form words and phrases and sentences, right? Communicate meaning. So in 750 BC, Greeks developed the first true alphabet that had 24 characters, right? That's the whole alpha and omega stuff, right? And it was a simple, efficient way of transforming that spoken word into a written form, right? And there's other types of written forms, right? Um, or a character represents a phrase or an idea or a concept, that sort of thing, versus just a sound, right? Um, I'm not a linguist by any stretch of the imagination, right? So I'm not going to delve too deeply in deep. I'm not going to dive too deeply into that, right? Um, and but in any case, developments of these more tonal-based alphabets, these sound-based alphabets. Uh, kind of ushered in the end of oral tra uh, cultural uh, oral traditions and oral based cultures, right? 
once we add a way to capture the, the core um, information of a given civilization. So, codex and paper. All right, so codex were these sort of rectangular papers. They were sewn together right on one side. They were an improvement from Piper scrolls, right? Because of this one long continuous thing. You had to kind of unscroll with one hand, you know, you know, tighten up with the other hand. It was just cumbersome, right? And it was a lot slower than just being able to turn to the right page. And um, in the early days, they were done by hand. And then later on, people did wood engravings uh, of them, which was quicker and higher quality in some ways. Um, and you could kind of ink them and put them on paper, but it was still a lot of labor to produce a wood engraving, right? And then obviously, you know, printing press came along after that. Now obviously we have paper, right? This notion of paper that came after the the the, the, the uh, Piper Scrolls, so the Codex, and you had the paper. So the paper was invented by the Chinese. It was brought to the Europe in the late Middle Ages, and by the 15th century, it pretty much replaced um, the codices because they were still expensive, all things considered. Um, and that's what we have today. <laughs> Gutenberg's printing press, like I said, was based on movable metal type, all right? And the church was an early customer of these early publishers, right? Um, it became a mass communication tool and had a profound um, catalyst to the Protestant Reformation, right? You know, there were more than 300,000 copies of Luther's publications, right? And Protestants really seized on this technology and they were out publishing the Catholics by 10 to 1 in the middle 16th century. The Catholics wanted to maintain the existing order. So, you know, especially earlier on, they saw the printing press as uh, something not to utilize, right? They didn't want to get these arguments out any qu more quickly than what they were. Uh, later on, they tried to produce their own publications to counter Protestant messages, but. They just never latched on to the technology to the same way as Protestants did, and well, so now you had a big break within the Catholic Church, right? So newspapers stimulated free expression. And in the early days, newspapers were lots of advertisements. Just, you know, they still were lots of advertisements even in the later days. A little bit of content and generally still the case today highly sensationalized content although there are more rigorous safeguards put into place in vetting of sources that occur now that never happened in the early centuries of newspapers right much more early newspapers were much more gossipy materials right it's just not like the page six stuff right or it's in new york city or you know or the um tabloids in the supermarket that you would see like you know you know, I saw an uh, alien UFO, or I was, you know, you know, medically probed by aliens, or you know, that, that sort of stuff, right? So, um, governments generally responded to newspapers um, to try to clamp down on their free expression by requiring licensing, by, uh, by just outright saying, you cannot publish this. This is a dictate. You are not going to publish on a certain material, and all governments do that, including our own. Um, there are some censorship controls, you know, that it's try to get imposed for like um, classified information, right? Um, and then obviously, um, there's censorship over certain types of materials, right? Um, so it had an impact, newspapers did, on the American Revolution, right? So papers originated in England, Right, they found their way pretty quickly over to the colonies, in terms of, of the communication mechanism, and they had the role of helping to unify the colonies, and they really swayed public opinion. Um, the people who were writing these publications and the other pamphlets that they would print, towards um, moving towards independence. Right. So. All right. 
So I mentioned a little bit earlier about hypertext. Um, then you have Bush envisioned Mimex, right, which was sort of this primitive linking uh, system, right? Um, you know, it was a kind of very forward-thinking look at things. Um, never really tucked off, took off or anything, right? So then you had T Ted Nelson. He coined the word hypertext, you know, in his you know stories, and proposed the creation of Xanadu, right? And then later on, you had um, Engelbart came along and directed the construction of the online system, right? He gave the mother of all demonstrations, right? We were showing a computing system with Windows and electronic mail and the use of a mouse for controlling um, visual elements on a screen and doing video conferencing. This is late 60s. This is why he's still called the mother of all demos is because he was demonstrating concepts that were 20, a year, 20 years ahead of their time, more or less, you know, 15 to 20 years ahead of their time when he did. So it was pretty profound. Um, people thought he was crazy that it was, that this was never going to be used. People having individual computers, that just didn't seem like a thing at the time. Um, but it was, you know, he was very forward thinking and he saw how computers would be used in the future. And he was right. So, information technology issues. So we looked at all the promise and and um, and um, the technology is provided us with, um, and but it does have some issues, right? So what is information technology? Anything that can be used in the creation, storage, um, the modification, um, getting uh, information out to folks, right? Um, anything that can help with, you know, that involves data and sound and images, right? And that's computers and telephones and video cameras and MP3 players and so on and so forth. And the hallmark of information technologies has been for many decades that costs are falling and capabilities keep rising, right? So we get more for less. Okay. And then again, here's the picture of of um, Engelbart giving his mother of all demos back in the day. There are video, uh, YouTube video clips that you can go and download. I might have linked to one in the supplemental material. Um, it's really interesting. It's a long, I think the one video I've seen of it is a very long video. So, um, but it's, 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 it's an amazing, amazing video. So you should go watch it sometime. So, what are some common IT, IT issues? Well, email is an easy way to keep in touch, but spam has become a real problem, right? Now, granted, um, we have lots of countermeasures to spam systems now, you know, Bayesian-based spam filters and neural network-based spam filters. For the most part, keep a lot of this stuff at bay, right? Occasionally, things come, still accidentally get through, or, um, thing or emails that aren't spam get accidentally marked as stuff and we have to go into a spam folder after the fact and manually correct it but it's okay you know for the most part you know you know email uh, serves as a valuable business tool and a valuable communications tool for individuals and it's it provides more benefits than harms I think um, it's sometimes easy to become overwhelmed by email or, or not want to take the time to organize one's email but, um, you know, it is what it is there. The web obviously provides free access to who much of information, but the web has created um, social networks, right, um, that may be harmful to individuals' mental health, right? It may create unhealthy addictions. No, I wouldn't say addictions. Addictions is always a strong word. I don't like to utilize it. It may create habitual tendencies for certain individuals. Um, it's created a lot of businesses, but it's also, you know, it's it, it's created a lot of harm. It's created a lot of, um, it's it's harmed the mental health of a lot of folks in certain social networks that the web has created. And it's caused those people a lot of depression issues. It's caused some people to go and commit suicide. It's brought, um, it's really hurt some people. And this is something that we can explore in greater depth in our in-class discussions. Obviously, a cassette disc and um, MP3s. Um, provide free yeah, or nearly free 
copies of music. Um, there's also facilitated an environment which it's easy to just um, share that and share those files with everyone, right? Take a CD, you rip it, you got that music. Um, back when I was still going through, you know, you know, my early college days and grad school days, you know, those um, peer-to-peer sharing net. I don't want to call them peer-to-peer, but they were, yeah, in a way they were. They still had a centralized server attached to them, like Napster and Grokster and, and all that sort of stuff. And people could, you could download hundreds upon hundreds of megabytes of, of music, right? From every musician possible. And that robbed them of having the value of, of being compensated for their their creative outlets, right? A lot of people would say, well, I can never afford this music on my own, or... I just, um, you know, I, these, I, or I would never have been exposed to hearing these types of artists because I didn't have the money to buy all types of music. And some would say, well, those are just excuses for not doing the right thing. So again, these are issues that we can explore in greater depth in, in our in-class discussions. And I think are, it's fascinating to, to discuss those issues. All right, credit cards. Obviously, um, you know, in the early days, there were times when you know, as, as businesses were starting to take advantage of the web and they're setting up storefronts and were creating their early software systems to actually process transactions, right, on the web. People put up storefronts, they had services or products they were willing to sell you, and people bought them. You p- had to put in their credit card. A lot of people were hesitant to do that because, well, I'm not sure if my credit card information is going to remain safe. And people should have been rightly so. At, at times, the credit card information wasn't even encrypted, right? Now, granted, most people didn't realize that, and that they were only to take advantage of the systems, but some people did put their credit card information into systems that weren't encrypted. Or companies, you know, even long after encryption came about, would keep all that credit card data on store on, on file and make it easier for people to order additional products in the future because that whole process of having a user um, or a customer check out can take a while and can sometimes, you know, if they're web, if they're network connection is slow or an error occurs it could cause a person to ban finalizing a cell so though keeping all that credit card information on file was something that they could draw upon make it easier for someone to do repeat purchases obviously that came with issue because it was stored in databases it eventually became a wonderful repository of information for hackers if they could grab the database with all the credit card data in it they could take all that information they could utilize it themselves they could sell it to nefarious groups either through other types of IRC chats or other online forums or on the dark web and various forums on the dark web um, so on and so forth right and that increases the possibility of identity theft once you get that credit card information it gives you the ability to get other types of credit card information or maybe in the person's credit card report and now they have a new part-time job which is to undo all that damage so it brings up the interesting question we can talk about in our our class-based discussions, who owns the information about transactions? Whose responsibility is it to protect one's financial information? Is it the individuals? Is it the credit card companies? Is it the um, merchant? Um, is it the processor of the credit card transactions? Do they use a third-party processor? Whose responsibility? Is it all our responsibility? Is it no one? Is it the government's responsibility? So interesting questions that can be debated. Um, so another interesting technology that we talk about um, are GUIs, right? So back in the day, when the first, you know, from mini from mainframes, the mini computers, the early PCs, the command line interface dominated, right? And in a lot of ways, the command line interface has come back um, in vogue because it it offers certain productivity advantages and it just more flexibility than what you can ever get in a GUI, right? Because GUIs take work to build. Someone has to design them, someone has to implement code for them. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to add a new capability to a command line interface program than it is to a GUI because you have to build in the widgets, you have to build in the extensions to the event handling mechanisms, you have to provide additional singling mechanisms to certain widgets when something takes place if you want them to be dynamic in terms of how they update. So it takes a lot of work to develop a GUI, whether that GUI is in a heavyweight desktop application 
or if it's in a um, progressive web app or it's on a website or you know or in some other form it takes a lot of effort so the folks at Xerox Park who had a great R&D facility back in the 70s and 80s but couldn't you know outside of the copier couldn't uh, market their way out of a paper bag or get something uh, product deployed to save their lives um, had the Xerox Park of the Palo Alto Research Center so Alan Kay saw the Doug um, um, Engelbart demo back in 68 was inspired by created a whole series of auto auto uh, mini computers I don't know why I have it described as personal computer maybe I came from the author they were really mini computers right which is a little different from a personal computer somewhat larger bulkier more expensive right but you could kind of see where this was going um, and as an I said, there are a lot of great YouTube videos of people taking auto systems and restoring them and using them and using the software that was on them. So I would encourage you to go look at those YouTube videos. Um, they had bitmap displays and they used keyboards and, and, and mice on them and all that sort of stuff to interact with the, with the GUI system. Um, some systems, you know, were fixed windows. You couldn't overlap them. Some of them, I guess you probably could. Um, and then at some point, Steve Jobs comes along. He visits the Xerox Park, sees the immediate, immediate potential of a GUI, um, and eventually has groups at Apple develop the Macintosh, right? Shortly before he gets ousted from Apple the first time. And it had bitmap displays and a keyboard and mouse. Their first effort was the Apple Lisa. It was a failure because they sold it at $10,000 in 1984. You could multiply it probably by four in today's dollars I'd have to look it up and it was just just not reachable for the typical consumer right their later um, you know their later um, Macintoshes that came along that were GUI based were far more successful and much more approachable to education markets and businesses and graphics designers and individuals right um, obviously along the same times Microsoft also saw value and GUI system. They originally worked with IBM. They were trying to develop OS2, you know, based on, you know, you had the DOS and, and you know, and, you know, uh, and, and doing sort of this, this Windows-centric system. They eventually decided to go off into their own thing with Windows. Um, and, and in typical Microsoft fashion, it takes them three times to get something right. So they had Windows 1. The slide kind of, um, um, kind of skews the timeline a little bit. So Windows 1.0 came in 1985 because they saw the potential of it, but it was a very primitive system. I can't even get a copy of Windows 1.0 running in a virtual machine, and I have tried. Um, it, it is hard to do it um, because it only worked on a small set of hardware devices. Right? And same thing with Windows 2.0. I've had a little bit more success with it, but I, I can't really use it for anything. The earliest I can use of something, I think, is maybe Windows 3.1. I have a virtual machine for, uh, maybe 3.0. I have to look around. But in any case, um, in 1990, Windows 3.0 got released. The first version of a GUI on the Windows side I ever used, or on the DOS side, was Windows 3.1, and those were far more capable systems. They really, really were usable systems, and PCs were, of course, more affordable than Apple systems. So, same thing today, isn't it? <laughs> Some things never do change. And, um, and Windows quickly became the dominant graphical user interface. And by this time, Jobs had been gone from Apple for years, and when the Next and Pixar and all that sort of stuff, was, and Apple was sort of on a decline, right? Um, Jobs came back in 97, an investment from Microsoft, of all people, um, helped to save the company. And, um, well... <laughs> It became one of its one of the most valuable, you know, Fortune uh, 500 companies today, right? So, all right. So, single computer hypertext systems. So, you had um, Peter Brown at the University of Kent released his uh, guide on this stuff back in '82. Versions for Macintosh and IBM PC were released. Um, there's this interesting little thing that Apple did back in the late 80s called a uh, hypercard. And hypercard was sort of their um, basic with a GUI type systems, right? So they were programmable presentation stacks, I guess, is a way of looking at them. But you could link 
one part of a of a stack to another, you know, one card to another, um, using the, essentially these hyperlinks. And the links were represented by buttons, and they were even the basis for games like Myst and 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 Reven, right? So they were. It was a pretty profound thing. Uh, this hypercard. So again, go watch videos on hypercard. And just keep it in the context of the time it was invented, right? And it was used. We're talking the 80s. We're talking about pre-web being built. So, And again, I've mentioned before about Tim Beniers Lee at CERN and Switzerland in the 90s, created the World Wide Web. Um, and that was the HTML stuff. And then obviously you needed a transport protocol to go along with that, the HTTP, or to be able to uh, transmit web requests uh, from, from a server to a computer. And um, it rode as an application level protocol on top of the transport TCP protocol, transport you know communication protocol, and an internet protocol. Um, and eventually, web browsers, more robust web browsers, were built around um, the the web. Mosaic being the, the first popular one, and then. Uh, Netscape came along with their Navigator browser, which eventually um, developed into the Mozilla browser. And then, um, but they charged for those browsers. Those browsers, the, the 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 Netscape browsers, he had to pay like forty bucks for. Them. And Microsoft came along and said, "Well, we got an operating system. Why don't we just put a browser in there and give it away for free? All right? We still sell for the operating system. It's not like we're losing out on that." and basically ate Netscape's lunch, right? And then, you know, the, the remnants of Netscape existed in Mozilla, exist in Mozilla today, but, um, you know, in, in Firefox, right? And, um, but, you know, Internet Explorer was a very, was a very popular thing for a long time. Okay, so, you know, obviously, um, these web browsers and the web and all this stuff have had a very profound influence on our society. So, you know, it enables lots of different applications. For example, it lets us per, it lets us monitor traffic in real time on the web, right? So, this is a graphic from 2007, in Washington State, right? So, probably not too far away from where my grandfather lives. So, um, I think he lives up there in Woodenville. And um, anyhow, so um, this is obviously a more primitive system being from, you know, 2007, right? But it, it illustrates the basic uh, notion that we can actually monitor traffic conditions on the web. Now, ODOT, for the state of Ohio, has a website. You can go out and I occasionally, from time to time, will monitor uh, conditions um, I'm more not. In, I'm not interested so much in traffic and the traffic volumes, although I guess you could look at that. I'm more interested when there's adverse weather. I'm interested in looking at uh, what its sensors are detecting in terms of surface conditions, what it thinks the surface pavement temperature is, because that can tell me whether things are freezing up or not. And and yes, the average speed of the traffic, because if I know it's a 65 mile per hour speed limit highway and the average tra speed of the traffic and, and rush hour going across it is like 30, it probably tells me, and it tells me it's icy as well on the road, that probably tells me road conditions aren't great. And a lot of them also have links to web cameras, right, that are positioned to give us, you know, occasional snapshots of interstate traffic. So it's great from that standpoint. And I talked about the development of search engines over time, right? So the earlier crawler-based engines, and really even the modern web engines, like with Google Alta, Alta Vista, they're still crawler-based systems. They'll still go through every linkable resource on the web from one point to the next and just collect all information on all the web pages, right? And they use that to construct a, a web page database and they employ varying types of, of algorithms to, um, you know, you know, the, the, to determine how to best list relevant web pages to a given uh, search query. All right, and then obviously you have human-assisted engines, um, open directory, right, for instance. Humans basically build web page databases. Um, the summaries are more accurate, but you can't, you can only 
organize small subsets of pages, and they tend to go out of date. And these sort of human-assisted engines, or these um, engines come and go in varying forms, right? Um, a lot of people, uh, even to this day, on like GitHub websites, right? For very hyper-focused um, type um, topical discussions, they'll, they'll have a GitHub repository of links to sites on a given topic, right? And it generally works okay. I mean, you know, there's some good ones to follow. Um, and then obviously there are some hybrid systems. And boy, this, this textbook is really starting to date itself, right? Um, MSN search. I guess it's Bing search now, right? Um, I guess it's still called Bing, right? Um, but it, it, and it might be the second most popular web engine, right, after Google. Um, or I don't know if it's even the second, right? So probably Google is probably still the first, right? Um, in most places uh, outside of, you know, especially in the U.S. I mean, it's possible that, um, like I know in places like Russia, there's a there's a Russian language focused search engine. Is that VK or something like that? That's more popular, um, or it's pretty popular. But then after that, you probably get like DuckDuckGo because it's a privacy um, focused search engine. Um, then you might get Bing, and then you probably get like I guess Alta Vista still around. I haven't ever tried going Alta Vista, and there's probably some other search engines out there that you can go to as well. So issues. Obviously, we've mentioned about the pirating issue uh, at various points in time. Um, obviously, digitization, if I can ever get the word out, um, provides us perfect copies of content, right? So distribution costs are, are pretty cheap as a result, right? It's fast, it's inexpensive distribution. The result tends to be illegal downloading. So. Um, Although many here at the university would probably find the Games of Thrones not to be family-friendly viewing, I certainly would not consider it family-friendly viewing. It's definitely, uh, it would probably be, um, well, it's an HBO production, so obviously it's, a, it's, 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 it's not that. Um, even though they do um, uh, Sesame Street stuff now. Um, but that first season, uh, first season, that first episode of season five, I guess it was, was illegally downloaded more than one million times in the United States, so it was a very popular series when when it was when it was on the air, I guess, and people really wanted to have access to it. Um, you saw that more recently with some of the newer Star Trek series that came out, right? Something I'm more interested in, and um, you know, obviously it was it was held, you know the original Star Trek series and the TNG and the Voyager and and the, the retrospective, um, you know, um, Enterprise series, right? All those were on, you know, public networks, and they were advertiser-supported, and, you know, these were put behind the CBS All Access paywall, right? And also licensed to Netflix for international distribution outside the U.S. and Canada. And, um, and obviously there's probably been a lot, from what I understand, a lot of illegal downloading of content for this. You know, it, it's an ethical issue. You know, if you have the ability to pay seven bucks a month or twelve bucks a month, whatever it is, to with advertisements or without advertisements, you know, some people say you should do that. You should just do that, and and obviously that comes. Um, obviously, you have the means you can do that, right? You can pay and get that content in a legal way. Obviously, some folks don't, and some would say it's okay. Some would say it's not okay because otherwise they would never become aware of the content they didn't. Um, there's some studies out there that indicate that, well, piracy does increase visibility of a given product and can lead to a more legit use of that product by those individuals down, down the road, which increases the number of um, viewers of a TV series or a movie or something like that, right? So, and, and so it has an impact there. So three quarters of Chinese users, you know, probably more so back in the day, have used pirated versions of, of Microsoft software. It was probably higher than three quarters even. I think that number's low, in my opinion. Um, just because given what m typical Chinese, Chinese worker would make in a year versus what a licensed copy of Windows would cost, I mean, it was, it was an, not an insignificant cost. So it's kind of understandable. And, you know, and, and Linux didn't really 
I mean, Windows has a lot of uses, right? It, you know, supporting Office. It wasn't the great supporter of open so source software that it is today, and and they don't have the desire to get their software on as many platforms now as they did back then. They wanted to keep a closed ecosystem, hence the piracy, so you could use things like Office or play video games. And really, to this day, video games still tend to be skewed towards um, being played on. On um, on Windows-based systems than on Linux or Mac-based systems, right? So you know, obviously there are exceptions. Like I enjoy the strategy games, so things like you know Civilization, that sort of thing, are you know actually are one of the few exceptions. Things that you can enjoy on a non-Windows-based system, um, you know, you know. But um, but uh, I think that. Situation is getting better. I think uh, China is a little bit more respectful of these days of intellectual property than they have been. Um, and I think as a society becomes more prosperous and they become um, more integrated into um, the global community, um, the more likely they are to be respectful of intellectual property rights. Right. And I think again too, the the more we see democratic representative governments come to more countries, the more um, respectful of those countries tend to be of the rule of law and of um, intellectual property rights throughout the world, not even just within their own country. So, all right, credit cards obviously have a convenience server cash and checks. Again, we've talked a little bit before about who um, is responsible for those transactions and that sort of thing. Loan applications, they can be based on your credit history, not on a personal interview, right? So, and certainly in the case in the United States, our ability to secure home mortgages and car notes and uh, and uh, other types of personal loans to be able to get financing to go to college or universities in some cases is based on our credit history and we have a lousy credit history we find it a lot a lot far more difficult to make it through uh, life right so in order to get or not to have to pay so much money in interest right that can be a drain too right if we have better credit histories we get better interest rates which means it costs us less money to own a home or own a car or some sort of other product. So, and obviously there are issues um, that information technology, obviously in this day and age with the pandemic going on with telecommuting, right? There's a lot of issues. Before this pandemic hit, a lot of companies um, were, um, um, were, were definitely against doing telecommuting. They only supported it in limited circumstances for certain employees. And some companies even had allowed some telecommuters to reverse trend. Yahoo, when Marissa Myers went to Yahoo, said, no, we're going to all come back into the office. I, I think it's important for everyone to be located in one building. There are certain um, synergies that take place that um, happen best in person. And, and, and to some degree, she's right. Um, if you are on site working with others and not with a highly communicable disease present in your society, then yes, you know, there are certain things that, um, they're just synergies that take place and can have certain types of productivity. Others would argue though, well, it just gives a, a, an environment in which people can micromanage. And yes, it does. Certain companies, certain managers are gonna micromanage and they're gonna create, in some cases, less productive environments because people are just always nervous and um, are stressed out by the micromanaging aspects. Some people do need to work in an office too, um, so telecommunication, a lot, they, they're more productive, right? I come into this office here, well, one, because my wife is a remote employee uh, and she needs to utilize the downstairs office for her um, remote sessions that are online. So um, pandemic or not, it would be much more difficult for me to work at home um, to find a, a space in which to do that, right? I have my space in the office, but if she's using the office at the same time, to do online sessions it doesn't it wouldn't be very feasible for me to also be down there also talking on a remote session so I'm grateful I can come into an office um, I'm, I feel blessed by having an office in which I can come and record these lessons or to be able to hold zoom sessions remotely if I need to and uh, it's been additionally uh, during the early days of the pandemic and the the shelter in place um, and being able to be an essential employee and be able to come in here to still hold my lectures was was a tremendous blessing for me. Um, and I appreciate it a, a great deal. So, 
But telecommuting is a big issue, and it's going to be a big issue for you all as, as computing professionals. Um, it has a lot of advantages. You know, with the, with, the, with the skill set that you have, in a lot of cases, why do you need to be in a given building to work on something? If you're not an embedded developer, why do you need to be at a, a space with specialized tools and, and labs and all that sort of stuff, right? If I'm doing full stack web development, I can do that as easily from Mount Vernon, Ohio as I can in New York City. And it's a lot cheaper in Mount Vernon, Ohio to, to, to be a worker. I could work for less for you as a company, right? Um, maybe not a whole lot less, right? Um, ideally, so, but, but then I'm probably going to be making more. I don't have to spend as much for my housing. I don't have to spend all the costs on a car and commuting and all that stuff. And I have a lot more purchasing power for, um, I can save extra money, I can make extra investments, I can have more disposable income. Uh, generally, it's a benefit in other areas of the society, right? I'm not stressed out from a lot of time spent, you know, in traffic and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of great issues around that. And then obviously things, we're going to look at communication issues, right, in this course as computing professionals. Um, how much of our personal information should companies be allowed to sell to other companies throughout the world? Should companies be able to outsource their jobs to other countries, right? That's been a big issue for computing professionals. It hit me especially um, hard as a computing, as a Gen X computing professional doing during two downturns, right? The dot-com bust of the early aughts and the global recession of the late aughts, right? So, um, and we were particularly, as Gen X workers and, and early millennials to a degree, were much more sensitive to the issues surrounding the outsourcing of jobs and others. A lot of cases, we were told that our jobs were being downsized and, and not specifically to me, I, I was never in that particular predicament, but I, I knew of others and read stories of others who um, were found with situations like, well, we're letting you go. Um, you can get six months of severance or whatever the severance package was, but you have to train your replacement. And that's an incredibly demoralizing situation to an individual. My job is being lost. Someone is actually taking my job and I'm training my replacement. And it, it created a lot of resentment among folks, especially if that job was going to someone that was overseas. You know, they knew that you know they were making maybe seventy thousand a year, but that replacement was making fifteen thousand a year in another country, and that job wasn't coming back. And especially if they had been in that job for many, many years, um, people got bitter and they got resentful, and that created a lot of particular political. Um, issues um, and shape the political arena to some extent. So, um, and also, should companies be, you know, what are the ethical issues companies have to be aware of, particularly if they are tech companies that just don't manufacture s software? They make hardware and software, like Apple, right? What are Apple's responsibilities in their contractual um, relationships with, say, Foxconn, for instance, that manufacture? you know, Apple's, you know, iPhones and iPads and other uh, computing devices. Um, you know, pretty much anything outside of Mac Pros, right, that are still done in some cases in the United States, right? So, and with the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web has been a conduit for democratic ideals throughout the world, although we're seeing a balkanization of the web occurring in different countries with different nation-level um, um, firewalls being placed, not to keep stuff out, but to keep certain, well, keep that things out from other countries, but also to keep certain things in, in some cases. Um, do we, in, in the years and the decades to come, see this, this balkanization of the web where there's, the, you know, and we, I think we are, I think we are. There is a North Korean internet. Um, they've never really been open, but yeah, there is a, a web, a North Korean web. It's very limited. It's very interesting. Go watch videos on it. Um, but there's a Chinese web, right? There is a, a, a Turkish web. There is a um, Saudi Arabian web, right? Um, and I think they're becoming more and more balkanized. And we may be going back to a more uh, nation level or regional level types of internet. Or at least for certain countries, I'll have a very open democratic, um, um, democratic, re um, democratic republican type of governments. Um, 
you're gonna see this this restrictions on the um, freedoms of expression and their net their internet's going to be very different from ours and yes you can get around it with vpns and encryption to some extent and so on and so forth but it's always going to be a cat and mouse game and in some cases the web can be turned around by the governments on their citizens and be used as, as, as a tool for, for oppression. And what are the ethical issues surrounding that? There's some fascinating ideals, right? In terms of being able to turn around and use it for surveillance purposes. Um, you know, revolutionary disco discoveries are rare. Um, information technology has a long history, as we've seen here. Um, and the one sure thing out of all of this is that the rate of technological change continues to accelerate year in and year out. And we don't want to ask ourselves, what will the computer do to us? What we do want to ask is, what will we make of the computer? How will we use it in benefit ways that benefit society as computing professionals? All right, and that's what we'll follow up with in classroom discussions. Look forward to talking to you all.